why make a podcast based on mm. active inference? Um, wh why this concept in cognitive science and what is it? Yeah, so I, I as I again said to you before, I mean, I, uh, my, original, my original love in academia, even you know, going back to school, was philosophy. And I loved philosophy, I think, in part because it, ans it tried to answer the big questions, which is probably why we all enjoy it. In some ways, it feeds that kind of part of the child self that is curious about things that people end up not thinking about, um, these classic existential questions, for example. And I feel like some of my undergrad, um, which again, as I told you, was in modern languages and linguistics, sort of beat that out of me a little bit. It was quite technical. And then I did a psychology master's at UCL. So this was 21 to 2022, 20, 2021 to 2022. And about halfway through, um, with my supervisor, Miles Tuft, who's wonderful, and shout out to Miles, he's an experimental psychology lecturer at UCL in social cognition. We sort of both discovered active inference at the same time. And it was one of these amazing moments where I went, wow, there's a theory which is philosophically really fucking interesting. And it's mathsy and technical and has that kind of sheen to it and is robust in that sense. And can be, and is originally grounded in neuroscience and psychology and theoretical biology. And so I'm doing psychology. And it was just one of those really wonderful serendipitous things where I just absolutely fell in love with it in not a way that obviously one falls in love with, you know, a partner or a football club where it's enjoyable. I mean, did I enjoy having to learn all the maths and whatnot? Kind of, but not really in a kind of odd way. And so I got super obsessed with it, continued getting obsessed with it. And then around October, so really not that long ago, October 2023, I wrote the first draft of the Flow States paper, which is still under review and should be out very, very soon. It's at the final stages and the preprint is out there and stuff. And I presented it at Carl's Theoretical Neurobiology Lab at UCL, which I was very lucky to have got a slot there. And that was through Riddy Pitlia. Um, so thank you, Riddy. And you should definitely speak to her as well. She's great. And... Basically, from that, Carl and Lars and Jakob Limanowski jumped on the paper. And I just ended up being in quite constant communication with Carl. I mean, and then he ended up on this on the podcast. But actually, to come back to your question, why the podcast? I've been part of an institute, the institute. That's sort of how I learned about active inference in many ways. So if people are listening and want to learn more about active inference, the institute is a great place to start. They do textbook groups and stuff like that where you can learn alongside people. And I realized, okay, it has the textbook group and it really has live streams. And the live streams are super technical. I mean, it's people really just, it's like a conference, people talking about their papers. And there wasn't really this middle ground. There wasn't this kind of Goldilocks zone of, okay, learn with me. Let's do a general active inference thing. And I'd done some podcasting in the past while I was at uni and, and elsewhere. And I thought, okay, well, this is a good opportunity to one, learn more myself, to add something to the Institute. Um, and three, yeah, I mean, just, get to speak and learn and meet these wonderful scientists and philosophers and mathematicians. So I got in contact with Daniel and I said, Daniel, let's, let's do it. You know, what do you think? And he said, yeah, absolutely. And he's been incredibly supportive and helpful, you know, um, just making sure everything's running smoothly, but yeah, it's been an incredible journey. Um, in truth, I'm not sure how much longer it's going to go on because I have a PhD that I hopefully I'll be starting soon and I've got a job and whatnot. So, but it, it, yeah, it's it's been a pretty wild six months, to be honest. Where where did you uh, where where you, will you be doing your PhD? So I've applied to lots of places. I'm sure I can speak about that. I don't know why okay. I won't be able to. Um, uh, you, you've been applying. Well, I'm interested to hear that. Hear about that. Yeah, of, yeah, um, yeah. Well, well, it's uh, I I because I'm just you know I I love the the, the as you're telling me here and off the air, you know doing linguistics, doing psychology, and then finding active inference is kind of a unifying yep. framework. Um, I, uh, you know, relatedly John Vivekis theory of relevance realization, which, mm -hmm. which can be bridged, you know, very neatly with predictive processing, this with uh, relevance realization being this way in which we in the, kind of in the, in the words, we realize relevance, we, yeah. how do we solve all the complex problems we do? And it can be applied to how we understand language, to perception, to everything. And you can replace real relevance realization there with, with, you know, active inference. Um, it can do all those things too. And it's not. I mean, I, you know, I do economics and mm. uh, it kind of actually I'm starting to see how it is re related, but it's almost comforting and just really 
intellectually and not even just intellectually more than that just useful and valuable to know these theories because again you know people will be talking about things and just as John Viveki would describe oh wait I'm suddenly realizing relevance realization is the key to understanding so much in cognitive science and consciousness we don't understand it kind of gives me a grounding of like okay I don't know exactly what they're talking about there but you know I'm reading you know Douglas Hofstad um, yep. but you know it's so it's so relevant to realization it's just yeah, all yeah, there yeah, 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 and yeah. you know you're reading all the you know past cognitive science books and you're like but, and so from you know a series like Awakening from the Meaning Crisis and the philosophy and the cognitive science and everything that's there it's this course that then can make you versed mm. in, in all these other disciplines um, so yeah, I mean, in some sense, active inference does do that. In some senses, it doesn't. I mean, relevance realization at its heart um, is not a principle. It, it, it could be expanded yeah, to be yeah. a, a principle of physics. That, But really, fundamentally, it's a process theory. Uh, and what I mean by that, I mean, in the same way that active inference is a process theory. What does that mean? It means that it's an account, it's a theory of how certain functions are fulfilled. So relevance realization is also, if you actually decompose it, uh, has these so-called oppositional processing, um, explore, exploit, for example, dynamics, which John proposed, and this is before active inference, so I think this is sort of 2011, 2012, that these kind of uh, oppositional dialectics, when they're working in concert, yield relevance realization. So he's actually giving an underlying process to a higher order cognitive capacity. Now, the free energy principle doesn't do that. The free energy principle doesn't actually tell you anything per se about what exists. It just says that if things exist over time, they look as if they are conducting variational Bayesian inference over their external states. They look as, and that is if they are to persist. So if you Jack today are going to be the same Jack as you are tomorrow, then anything that you do, as long as the, that identity remains the same, can be described in terms of uh, Bayesian inference and optimal Bayesian design. So the free energy principle itself, and Carl will say this, is actually in many ways slightly empty because it doesn't really tell you anything that actually happens. But then you get active inference or predictive processing or variational message passing, or you get these POMDP schema. And now you start to see, okay, how could this actually be implemented in complex cognitive creatures like ourselves with hierarchical brains, you know, literally anatomically hierarchical ridged brains, and then you start to then you can start to make empirical predictions. So I only say that because I think there's just a slight difference in a way between relevance realization and free energy principle. The free energy principle just tells you, well, we all have to obey by the free energy principle in an incredible in, in somewhat of a boring way. Where the money really is is given that, how do we obey by the free energy principle? How do we abide by the free energy principle? And then you start getting the process theories like the Bayesian brain hypothesis or predictive processing. Ah, I see. It's so that's that's really helpful. And then can I just probe into yep. that? And if sure. I'm just trying to understand this correctly, with the free energy principle and it being uh, something which is yeah, kind of a tautology and it's not necessarily interesting uh, in and of itself. Um, I might be again conflating free, the free energy principle, this more base structure and mm. theory, with applying that to cognition, like with predictive processing, yep. but. Um, Surely is there are ways in our cognition that we can be sort of out of sync with the world for prolonged periods of time um, and in such a way. And maybe this is getting into like how psychopathologies work. But, you know, if, if you know what I mean. And so sometimes it seems to me that predictive processing would be like, on average, in mm. equilibrium, you mm -hmm. are you must be coupled with the world, you know, unless you, you die or, you, you know, you're going right. to you, you end. But, but uh, you know, uh, but, but, you know, then maybe, maybe you're saying to be exactly the same. I guess we're always changing and like you could, yeah. Yeah, so there's, so this, there's no, uh, you don't have to invoke something like a fixed state space in active inference. Um, okay. So this is a, th th there's a couple of things here which are relevant. So one is that you don't have to say the same thing um, over time. So you have, this is the so-called path integral description of active inference, which is that basically it's a probability distribution over the, uh, over the path of states, not a probability distribution over states themselves. So that's a one distinction, which allows for this kind of itinerancy over time that you're tending towards something, but you don't have to be there right now. I mean, that actually lends itself to the other thing, which is that we're always talking about probability distributions, which doesn't mean that you always need to be at the peak of your probability distribution. If you've got a Gaussian or just a bell curve, yeah. um, you don't always have to be at the top of that bell curve. The point is, over time, 
you will tell, like if, if I flip a coin a hundred times, 50 out of 100, it might not actually be that, but it will tend to that distribution, right? And if I do that infinitely many times, then it will be that distribution. The idea is, is that you can think over this set period of time, at least I have this probability distribution that I'm tending towards. And this is why people talk about an attracting state. But you don't have to necessarily always be in your attracting state, right? You're just, if you can always just be described as tending towards the attracting state, given the thing that you are. Which actually brings me to my next point, which is that you mentioned psychopathologies, which is a really interesting thing. Remember that you and I are not the same thing. Right? You and I are not composed of the same Markov blankets. You and I are self-evidencing for our own models, but they're not the same model. Now, they might be very similar because we're both homo sapiens. We speak the same language you know, and so on, which means that we're more similar than, let's say, me and a turtle. But there's still going to be differences. What active inference or, well, yeah, what free energy principle really tells you is that Given if I can write down some like what you are, then the action that you do to remain that thing is a can be cast as a minimization of uh, variational free energy. But the point is, is that like there is no one, there's no one you, and two, there's no like optimal version of you, right? If you developed a psychopathology, you would still be doing optimal Bayesian inference, right? Just, well, approximately optimal Bayesian inference because it's always approximate. Mm -hmm. But that was just for the model of you with a psychopathology, right? So your priors, your the, the, the system of your belief, the composition of your beliefs would just be different, but it wouldn't make it worse or better. It would just mean that you're optimizing for a design that was different from how you were before you had your psychopathology. So this is called the complete class theorem in Bayesian design. And yeah, it's just the idea that uh, basically, you can just take any behavior and write it down as if it's a descent down a free energy gradient for a specific set of priors. So we can get rid of some of these worries about having to be in a fixed state space, not being able to move, being able, to, you know, being stuck in dark rooms. There is some flexibility in the free energy principle. That said, whether the free energy principle fundamentally or active inference rests on there being one underlying. Uh, attracting set for a thing, right? So that you have um, paths of state over time and even those are tending towards one underlying dynamic. That's, I think, is an open question. Um, so this is something that I know Kate Nave and Maxwell Ramstein have been talking about. And Kate, I think, again, I don't want to misspeak. Kate's coming on my show, so I'll make sure I ask her. Thinks that there's still a fundamental problem in active inference, which is that there's some underlying um, determinacy, one might say which is that even the distribution of these paths is tending towards an attracting set. And maybe that's fine, maybe that's not, but it does imply some kind of teleology. You as a philosopher might not care because you might say, of course, it's deterministic. Who said it wasn't? Um, but maybe some people might have problems with that. It's, there's, uh, a, there's a lot there, I'm sorry. Exact, no, no it, it's, a, it, it's great. It's Active inference is kind of becoming a little bit more weird, but also making more sense uh, in the sense of like, as you say that, it, I should kind of have understood that from from what uh, I know already. But it's also, again, sometimes in some way, as you kind of say, maybe counterintuitive in the sense that, you know, Mark Miller has tried to do work then on how we can use, say, predictive processing and active inference to try and think about well-being and optimal functioning. And what would you say to that? I mean, so so in a way, you can have an active inference account of any kind of state and, you know, you're tending towards some self-destructive kind of cycle. Yep. Um, but I mean, you know, if you're just destroying the kind of entity that is is the one doing, you know, relevance realization and, uh, you know, predictive processing, does that not perhaps kind of mean that you are doing something like that process itself is becoming less able to, you know, propagate itself in the world by virtue of you destroying the thing you are. So I don't know, maybe that is a, a, a way in which you can talk about active inference having a kind of, yeah, I don't know what you would say to that. Maybe that's getting and being in a whole heap of philosophical things about no. what is optimal flourishing, but yeah. Yeah. So there are a couple of things here, right? I mean, that's a good question what is optimal flourishing and no one necessarily knows i mean it's a question that obviously goes back to plato and aristotle and obviously well even further back you know you could take it all the way back to the shamans um the point being that certainly no one in active inference would throw out the idea that there is adaptive and maladaptive bayesian inference but it's just in terms of the pure mathematical mechanics that doesn't make sense 
in the same way as John will talk about um, the fact that a psychopathology is almost hijacking the uh, brain's inclinations. So, so what does that mean? Well, for example, um, you may hear, for example, that PTSD is actually extremely adaptive in a war zone. And what does that mean? That sounds very you know, facetious. Well, it's just that if I have, ex and, and let's just say PTSD for sake of, you know, active inference people is something like hyper precision over um, the likelihood of sensory data or hyper precision over sensory prediction errors you can have if you want to do in predictive processing language. Why would that be adaptive in a war zone? Well, it's really good idea to be super aware of what's going around, going on around me if bullets are flying around my head, right? So there are certain, there is, you know, given an environment there are certain ways of being which are going to be more adaptive. The problem is, is that we obviously exist in numerous environments over the course of our lifetime, which makes the, the, the real problem here is the fixity of the priors that we take towards the situations. And this, I think, is fleshed out in the actual psychopathological literature with PTSD, right? It's not that it was really maladaptive in the war zone. It's when they come home and then they think the threat is still alive. That is the problem because you have a prior action policy in place to set really high precision on the sensory data when you're in a suburban environment where like things are pretty calm and you can also bank on your priors, right? I mean, the point of having really, you know, what happens if you have really high precision on your sensory data is that you start mistrusting your own prior expectations more. Uh, there's this kind of trade off. And again, that works in a very volatile environment like a war zone because things change really quickly. But if I live in, you know, a suburban town, then, well, things are more likely to remain the same over time, but I'm bringing that same prior that I had in the war zone that things are going to change. So I think you can test the, I think the sort of litmus test for this is valence or, or kind of what Mark might call sort of well-being, which is that we intrinsically bodily feel how well we're doing in a given context, in a given eco niche. But there, again, there is no one, way of being it's just that obviously something like ptsd and generalized anxiety disorder and ocd are extremely maladaptive in modern cultures but again i wouldn't want to be particularly yeah. languid and chilled out in a war zone i mean you probably are going to be more <laughs> adaptive if you if you are a little bit more alert so again, this is not downplaying mental health disorders i would never do such a thing i mean having suffered with one myself the point being here is that if you just get right down to the nitty gritty of the Bayesian mechanics. It's all optimal Bayesian design from the respect of the priors that you bring into the situation. It's just like, maybe the, situ like the situation you're in is fundamentally incompatible with those priors. And there might be some dopaminergic problem where you can't modulate the precision over those priors. And so they get stuck. Um, yeah. Go but on, again, this, this, in many ways, this actually gives a, a last thing I'll say is this gives, in many ways, it sounds like I'm not, I'm underplaying mental health disorders. I'm saying that kind of there's that, you know, they're, they're all sort of optimal in some strange Bayesian sense. In many ways, this offers a far more humanistic approach to a mental health disorder, which is that you're not wrong or crazy or bad. Rather, there is just something literally structurally, a, a, you know, wrong, maladaptive. I wouldn't even use the word wrong, maladaptive given your eco niche. So no one's bad, no one's worse, no one, like, of course, given these cultural constraints, things are better, you know, there are ways to be better than you are, like, given those cultural constraints. But in terms of the actual underlying mechanics, we can be a lot kinder and compassionate and just say, okay, we just need to work on making you a little bit more uh, in a coherent and coupled relationship with your environment. That's really what it comes down to. That makes perfect sense because if I understand you correctly, you need to look at the high level dynamics of the, you know, the predictive processing system relative, and that's relative to uh, it, that agent's environment. Right. Uh, and so in a way you could say it's something like the mathematics, uh, the bottom level, and therefore you could say like, you don't need to pr propose that neurons are doing things incorrectly. I mean, neurons are firing how right. they're sort of designed to fire. Yep. They do what they do. So you, you're going to have to go some high level. And so that, that kind of makes sense of why and how the mathematics of the of, of active inference just kind of works as it does. Right. Uh, but that doesn't mean, uh, in fact, you know, as you kind of allude to there, it can actually give us a framework for trying to understand in a more systematic and you know, even compassionate way how that system, which is designed to go right, kind of goes wrong.
depending right. on the environment, depending on how we've set priors and whatnot. Exactly. I mean, one has to remember that active inference is it's, it's all about the coupled agent arena relationship. Um, what, what, what the free energy principle says is that an, an the internal states of an agent, an organism, a thing can be, can look as if they are, uh, you, you know, conducting Bayesian beliefs over external states over its environment. There is never, we are never not coupled in some sense to our environment, whether that's the, our culture, our you know, ecosystem, or whether it's just the room that we're in. There's always a coupled relationship going, and, and this has been known forever. I mean, this really came out obviously in the 90s with inactivism and autopoiesis and sense-making and the work of people like Evan Thompson and uh, Francisco Varela and others. But the point being that everything is about that relationship. Uh, it, it, really is, it really is the case that no man is an island. And so, or no woman is an island. Or no one is an island, but I was quoting John Dunn. John Dunn was probably sexist. Um, and, yeah, I mean, the, the principal point here being is that, yeah, I, there, there is, I, I'm very skeptical of the idea that, like, I, this actually comes back to... A, what um, R.D. Leng was saying in the 60s in, in psychiatry, which was that we used to just lock people up in madhouses and, you know, say that they were, they were done forever. But when you start realizing that uh, there's some underlying truth ground to what people used to call madness, hysteria, well, then you start saying, well, like, it's true for them, right? Like, and anxiety is really fucking true for the person who's anxious. So rather than saying there's something wrong with them, let's try and, as you say, get into the underlying mechanics and work from there. But again, this is, a, this is really not to downplay these, this stuff because, again, the valence is really guiding you here. And this is a point that Mark makes very explicitly, Mark and Julian Kiverstein and others, which is that the bod, like Mark's got this really nice paper out where he shows that well-being in many ways is, can be correlated with how well-tuned you are to your, what he, call, what he calls aerodynamics, what him and Julian and Sander van der Kooij called aerodynamics, which is the rate at which you're minimizing prediction error. And if you're really tuned into that, because the argument goes that the far, if, you're, if you are reducing prediction error at a faster rate than um, you expected, that's positive valence. You'll have this like, sense of doing well. If it's worse than you expect, you have this sense of things going badly. The more tapped in you can be to that, the more attentive you are to that, the more you can actually change your policies so that you start seeking out minima that give you better than expected prediction error minimization rates. So this all loops around to say that really the take home message from a well-being fund is like, you know, you have an embodied sense of how you're doing. And if Mark is right, which I kind of think he is, you have to use that as a guide. You want to use that as a tool. But again, this isn't not something that's, you know, you'll know what it's like. You go home after a day and it might not be something propositional, but it's just a bodily, that was a good day, that was a bad day. Yeah, it's interesting. I like that you bring in Mark's work thinking about happiness and, and valence and that kind of emotion. And actually, uh, instead of thinking about it as something that's kind of irrelevant or, you know, uh, you know, I mean, as well, we have a kind of like a, you know, sometimes a culture of like, I just, you know, you need to work hard and no pain, no game. And like, that's obviously, mm. that can be a kind of satisfaction too. Uh, but, you know, towards minimizing prediction error, but there is also a way in which your body and sort of your system can kind of tell you you're, you're actually minimizing prediction error really, you know, really effectively here. Right. Um, but it, I am fascinated though, and we have been talking about psychopathologies of the degree to which maybe we could have times in our life where we can be almost dissociated. So for example, people playing video games and they're, yep. you know, really play, minimizing prediction error in that environment. And uh, again, it kind of links back to something, you know, something I said at the start of uh, at what time scale does the thing sort of, you know, this reality hit you and at some point it hits mm -hmm. you, but it's, you know, I guess um, you could, f you know, for, for ages you could be living in a, a world where you kind of, you're minimizing prediction error dynamics in, many short-term niches yeah and could you be sheltered from that forever um so no, exactly that's very good that's exactly that's exactly how that's actually exactly what i thought when i first started thinking about relevance realization in fact and there's something i said to john when we spoke for the first time which is a classic response a classic critique of relevance realization is why don't we spend all of our lives in video games right <laughs> 
Like, I am super tuned in to what's relevant. And John has a nice framework here. You know, the, uh, the, um, the video game is normatively viable. It, you know, I know exactly what I need to do. It's descriptively viable. There's no ambiguity. Like, everything's really very clearly in front of me. There are rules I need to follow. So why is it clearly quite bad to spend your whole life in video games? And the point, really, what Active Inference gives you and I think this is really the nice convergence of active inference and predictive processing, which is what John... Oh, sorry. Uh, no, active inference and relevance realization. Although John will say predictive processing and relevance realization. We can get into that distinction. Um, what it gives you is a kind of a, an explanation for why being in video games the whole time is bad for you. And the point being is that you, Jack, me, Darius, like us as human beings are composed of bundles of embedded Markov blankets, embedded systems that are trying to minimize free energy. What does that mean? Well, there's obviously going to be a subset of those systems that are doing very well at minimizing variational free energy and having a great time while you're playing your video game. But you've, you, in some ways, the, the, many ways, the psychopathology is thinking that that's enough, right? That that's going to fulfill all of the variational free energy requirements that exist right up the embedded Markov blanket chain. And the point being is that if I played video games for 12 hours, I would need to piss, I would need to eat, I would need to sleep. And you are not providing evidence for any of those prior expectations. So there was a, a very old critique. I mean, old because active, it's not actually old, but active inference is very new. So old relative to the, the time that active inference has been around is this dark room problem. The dark room problem is basically the idea is if all we want to do is minimize prediction error, why don't we just go sit in pitch black rooms and do nothing, right? Like I will get no prediction error. The world won't be changing. It'll be fantastic. But it's, so, it's such, actually such an easy problem to skirt because that's not the case, right? Like, what about my food? What about my food requirements? What about my sleep requirements? What about my first requirements? What about my social requirements? And then the more you add those requirements, those expectations that make us the things that we are, you know what you end up getting? You end up getting a society, a culture. You end up getting your own life. So, like, we're quite elegantly coupled to our environment. Our environment. This is this idea of an eco niche. We've shaped our environment so that it's predictable, and by predictable, I mean it maximizes our model evidence, right? It allows us to maximize our model evidence. It allows us to uh, exploit the affordances that are in the environment, right? We've shaped it culturally so that it will do that such that, and like a really put a harmonious culture or agent arena relationship is one where the culture is giving me everything for my entire generative model, including all the levels of my Markov blankets. Again, a, lot, a culture that was only giving you video games will have a really hard time fulfilling all of those needs. So I think there's something to be said about well-being being coherent all the way up the generative hierarchy. And this is something that I'm, this is something that I've written on uh, with Libby Severs. Uh, we wrote this paper on Tourette's and this idea that I had called oppositional phenomenal self-modeling, which is in something like Tourette's or OCD or really a number of psychopathologies, you might have uh, you know, for example, if I tick, if I do a ticking behavior with someone with Tourette's, I'm kind of fulfilling uh, a prediction at a very low level motor arc, but I'm also negating evidence for this kind of higher order expectation that I'm a social being, I don't want to tick, right? I'm not a ticking thing. And so you see this kind of tension, which has led me to think, and I think I've, you know, I'll be writing some stuff with some people about this, um, is that maybe something like well-being is actually coherence all the way up the generative hierarchy such that the very low level motor system and the very high level conceptual system are working in concert with one another thank you and and, and I, I was reading your paper on Tourette so why don't you tell me tell me a bit more about that because I really do like how it kind of can show that even that, that we can look at the dynamics of the fact that we have to evidence that that we are for ourselves and that we are the kind of agent that we are but that 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 goes down to you know the immediate moment of me yep. grabbing a cup to me and my meaningful goals in my life so so tell me a bit more about that yes so this so the uh, the genesis of this paper it, it was kind of, it actually stemmed from libby's master's work i believe so libby's a phd student at the university of lisbon but they, this is some a topic that she had come across in her master's at the university of sussex and wanted to sort of write about um latterly you know once you get a bit of free time in your phd maybe you can do some writing on stuff that you want to, you know you want to do so i have been thinking about phenomenal self models and self modeling for ages all the way you know back to this flow states paper and before and i've had this kind of i could never really find the word for it but i had this idea that well maybe part of psychopathology is that you can you can think as if there are two agents and 
one has got expectations over certain states and the other has got expectations over certain states, but they can't, they can't both be fulfilled. So this was kind of a latent idea. And I think it's useful. Um, Francisco Varela had a phrase of selfless selves. If we can think of the internal states just metaphorically of a Markov blanket as being an agent who's trying to maximize model evidence for their model, well, then we are built up of selfless selves, right? selfless agents that goes all the way up to your prefrontal cortex and what we call the narrative self. Now, the narrative self, and this is work that goes all the way back to Dennett and Strawson, but recently has been really nicely um, explained and described by Jakob Hovey and others, is the narrative self or this kind of very strong epistemic sense of self is very much shaped by your culture, your language, your upbringing, your eco-niche and so on. Now, culturally, I think it's fair to say that most there, there is a taboo, a stigma. Most people culturally would not want to be the type of thing, the type of human being that is ticking uh, seemingly quite involuntarily. Right, it's a somewhat, uh, there's good empirical evidence for this that we cite in the paper that it's an extremely stigmatized illness. What does that mean? It means that if we can think of that little agent in the very high level Markov blanket, they have a preference to not tick, right? Because their expectations have been cultivated over the course of their lifetime, which is I want to be a socially acceptable, I mean, I don't, you know, from my position, again, I'm coming from the complete class theorem. It's, you, you know, it's just optimal Bayesian design, but they, you know, from their perspective, I want to be a socially acceptable, I want to fit in with everyone. But the problem is, is that you also have this lower level agent who, well, according to our theory, is dealing with sort of hyper precision over their sensory signals. So you can think of that as like hyper prediction error. And they've got an imperative to minimize that prediction error, right? Their, their entire if we can invoke some like as if teleology or as if purpose to them is to minimize uh, prediction error at this very low level sensory motor uh, level. Uh, you know, and you can think of this as like nociceptors, pain receptors, right? Like that's their function is to, well, is to alert the body to pain and then the body takes action to minimize it. And the point being that when uh, this comes out in the phenomenology and the qualitative accounts of Tourette's, these uh, individuals with Tourette's feel this incredible urge to tick because they have this what's called a premonitory sensation, this really uncomfortable feeling that they sense that you know, they're going to get rid of by ticking. Now, it's interesting because the part of the body where that premonitory sensation is, is the part of the body that they actually move. Now, why is that important? Because we know, and this work goes all the way back to Carl and Chris Frith's work in the early 2000s, um, about uh, sensory attenuation, which is that the regions of the body where movement originates, just before you move, sensory evidence in that part of the body needs to be attenuated, because if it wasn't, you would never move. And the reason for that is movement, according to active inference, and Chris Frith's comparator model and all this stuff back going back to the late 90s and early 2000s, is basically you have a, like, if I want to, I have a Diet Coke can, people are going to get onto me for, you know, the health freak story. Um, if I, you know, this is now in front of me. If I want to pick it up, basically what what the claim is, is that the brain has got a prediction that I am actually holding the, uh, the Coke cup. And there's prediction error that I'm not. And so I take action to minimize that prediction error. The, 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 the conundrum there is, well, why doesn't my brain just update its priors and say I'm not holding a Coke cup, right? And like, I just can't move, right? It just stays stuck where it is. And the point is you attenuate the sensory evidence um, that you're not holding the coat cup so as to so so that you can actually take the action to hold it. So it's called sensory attenuation. And what we claim is that sensory attenuation is at play in Tourette's because by moving the part of the body where you have this uncomfortable sensation, you are implicitly minimizing the sensory evidence from that part of the body. Right? So you can move in the first place. Does that make sense? Yes. Is there a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy with, with this Tourette's then? Because you like if you you wouldn't you could just try and curb it. Yeah, and not yeah. Do it, but but then gone. So, yeah. Well, no. So there, so there is this thing called tick suppression, uh, and tick suppression is exactly this. Which is Tourette's is a really interesting case. I mean, again, this is not my expertise. It'd be great to have Libby here. She'd be able to tell you a little bit more about the sort of anatomy and 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 the details. But we came across this idea, and it, Anil Seth's got this very nice paper uh, with. It will come to me. Um, Libby will get very angry at me if I can't tell you who's on it. So it will come to me. But um, <laughs> it, it, the basic idea is that ticks are not voluntary or involuntary, right? If that's the axis of 
agency. They're involuntary, which means that they can often feel involuntary. But actually, if you exercise a great deal of effort, you can um, you can actually resist doing them. Why is that important? The reason why that's important is because you by not so so by resisting doing the tick if we 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 in that paper talk about ticks as habitual actions you're kind of reducing the value of that tick action which if you want to look at the formula you'll see that you can reduce you're kind of reducing precision over that habitual action and so this kind of fits into a lot of therapeutic um ideas that you know the starting point of resisting doing a compulsion let's say an ocd or resisting a tick in Tourette's is always the first time you try to do it because the in active inference the the precision of your policy that your habitual value is so high that that's just always what you would do right so you've really got this urgency to do it and the more you can resist the more you can weaken that uh that habitual policy so what does that look like it looks something like top-down control uh in in sort of a more functional account of the brain so we're just exercising top-down control suppressing our ticks and then what you end up doing is actually uh, increasing the value of the policy to resist the ticks. So you're seeing a decrease in the kind of lower sensory motor level habitual policy and an uptick in the uh, higher order habitual policy. Now, that interplay, we actually just got our reviewers' comments back on that paper and they raise a good point, which is you haven't, we haven't given it in our model like how, why one level might predominate over the other. And this is the problem with deep generative modeling and deep parametric modeling is that like eventually you just run into like there's only so much you can build into your models. Um, but that's the basic idea is that there's just this conflict between a kind of higher order preference and a lower order preference. And therapy might look something like decreasing the habitual value of that lower order preference or lower order policy to provide evidence for the higher order preference. Do you think... Um... A related thing, um, well, let, let me know, is, is um, I have this kind of contention here now that you say that. Um, I remember Andrew Huberman talking about this kind of thing he would do where he would, mm. let's say he's trying to stop using his phone so much. He would like leave his phone there and purposely like let, let himself get distracted by looking at it and wanting to grab it. Yeah, yeah, then, yeah, like, yeah. Purposely, yeah. Oh, I'm going to go back to my reading my book instead of like putting it in another room in a way like training the ability right. to exert top down control and yeah, yeah, exert yeah. kind of greater high level goals uh down through the levels you think that's related i think that's very much related i think i think it's all it it all sounds very much akin to kind of exposure and response prevention therapy which is the kind of gold standard in ocd for example and the idea basically there is that so um habits are very important in active inference and you kind of only realize that i think when you start think like looking at pom dp schema and really getting into the computational modeling and it, it's if people are curious at what that looks like in the Bayes graph it's the e it's the letter E. So if you see a circle with the letter E, that's kind of, it's what we call your priors over policies, which is basically like, you can think of it as, as if I'm in, a, I'm in a certain context and every time I'm in that context, I do something, which means that my brain basically caches that action, that state and action association so that when I end up in that state again, I'm more likely to do that thing. And that's because in terms of action selection in active inference, we have the contribution of E, so these habitual values, and also G, which is expected free energy. So we're both doing, and we can get into what expected free energy is, but you're both doing an expected free energy calculation and sort of this automated stimulus response pattern. And this maps onto the ideas in reinforcement learning, if anyone's interested in that, about uh, model-based versus model-free decision-making. And so the idea with something like the Andrew Huberman thing would be is that in a certain context, let's say on his sofa, he has a certain stimulus uh, response pattern to grab his phone, right? And that we would say is like uh, a very, sh you know, these are the beliefs encoded in this E tensor. These are like very strong habitual value, right? And again, we can get into the maths on that, but I guess it's not too important. The point being is that you are eventually going to weaken evidence for that belief that in this context, I always do this one thing, if you can stay in that context and not do that thing. And so you're just weakening that belief that your brain really has, which says, okay, it, it's just this very like automated stimulus response pattern. And we can think of that really what's going on there is a, a so-called downweighting of precision, um, which is the kind of confidence you have in that belief. And you have this kind of, 
prior belief that in this context I'm going to pick up my phone and just over time you provide evidence against that belief and that belief becomes downweighted in terms of synaptic gain and then you stop picking up your phone but the problem is if you don't if you if you uh, like to finish if Andrew Huberman went to his bedroom and left his phone in the sitting room the problem is the moment he goes back into his sitting room nothing has happened to weaken that stimulus response pattern so I'm kind of shooting from the hip here because I haven't thought about yeah, yeah. That, that deeply but no, that, that's good. it would be very much explicable from active inference yeah, and it's, 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 it is fascinating, like, not necessarily getting to active inference per se, but just thinking in general about habits and the way in which it's, you know, you can't, we're cognitively limited agents. And so you realize just how much you rely on just all these kinds of right. flowing, just unconscious and things that are already set, which is why, you know, even I was talking to one philosopher um, John Rusin and we were just saying even like going traveling doing anything it's so stressful because we really you know you kind of you're just moving about the world and yep. you know getting to get your tickets and things but your day-to-day -day life can often be just you know you know what you're doing and you've planned right. things and we hate not to do it and it's kind of you know, awful to sort of um, not have kind of habits so to be able to you know uh, change them uh, it's kind of really difficult um, mm. I've been uh, I've been doing this uh this weird kind of movement meditation for a while now mm -hmm. called the Feldenkrais method, which is, I mean, literally, you know, lie down or you can do it like slow walking. It's effectively just incredibly slow controlled movements where you're just trying to imagine and literally like picture your body in space in like an imaginal way, as John Viveki would say. Mm. And just, just to try and move more effectively because, you know, the problem is, is like whether we've had injuries in the past or any other, or even just, just, you know, chance habit, we just have movement patterns that just don't work or ineffective or like cause pain and injuries and they become familiar and we do things to like, oh, you know, why, why sometimes you see people just walking on with a slight limp and you're like, why are you doing that? And you probably, you know, you had pain in the past or it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Again, you, you, you cause yourself pain, more pain by walking with a slight limp. But now that you have that pain, you're like, well, I need to do something to sort of counteract that. Um, and again, it's kind of difficult to explain this. I talk to people, I'm like, I don't want to explain this weird meditation. I'm lying down on the floor doing, Sounds it's not great. meditation, but it's some weird thing. But I do think active inference and predictive processing can kind of uh, help with that. Uh, and yeah. it's, yeah. I would, I would personally argue that again we can kind of get into the difference here i would argue that predictive processing per se is going to have a hard time accounting for that because predictive processing doesn't in isn't like predictive processing is a relatively uh minimal approach you know it's a pretty minimal theory it just has this kind of uh, cascading predictions going down and these um prediction errors rising up and they meet and through lateral connections they cancel you know they get cancelled out and you have one winning hypothesis but predictive processing, and this is why I thought it was important to mention this distinction between active inference and predictive processing. Predictive processing is not kind of the be-all and end-all. And for example, if you wanted to get habits, right, if you want to get these tensors, there are no tensors in predictive processing. So this is kind of more of like a meta-educational point about active inference, which is I think a lot of people get into it through predictive processing and predictive coding. Uh, and the work, and the really important and like really wonderful work of like Andy Clark back in the early 2010s or Jakob Hovi in the 2010s as well, but the theory, at least since Carl wrote papers in 2017, so deep temporal modeling or the Bert de Vries paper about graphical uh, factor graphs and graphical ba uh, brains, we now have, this, well, we have this very strict distinction in active inference between what's called discrete state space active inference and continuous state space active inference. And what you can basically think of, okay, what what is discrete state space active inference? Well, it's got discrete time variables. When would you want discrete time variables? Well, for example, when you're acting, right? So you're doing something at T for an expected result at T plus one. So actions, you know, you're selecting a, a discrete policy with, which is, and that policy, you know, if you look at an expected free energy equation that has the little subscript T and the subscript T plus one in it, these are discrete time variables. When is continuous state space at play? Well, presumably something like perception, or oftentimes, well, more broadly, attentional mechanisms, for example, it's constantly unfolding. You don't want to, you can't really say, okay, I'm going to slice perception at a singular moment and say this is discretized perception because it's always unfolding. Now, there's been a great deal of emphasis on discrete state space active inference, and that's where you get these nice looking factor graphs and this idea of a POMDP, which for people who don't know is a partially observable Markov decision process. It's a scheme. Um, just used in Bayesian analysis, Bayesian networks all use, well, most use at least uh, Markov 
uh, decision processes, if not partially observable ones. There might have been a, there's been a little bit, I would say, of a um, lack of attention or focus on how to build in continuous state space active inference. Uh, you may want to speak to Ryan Smith because I know Ryan is working on trying to have a kind of integration of discrete state space and continuous state space active inference. But it's always kind of why I mention that I'm. I always, you probably have noticed, I never really talk about predictive processing. I talk about active inference um, because uh, whatever you want to say, you can be pretty sure that they're not the same thing and that predictive processing is kind of a subset of active inference. Um, active inference in many ways comes down to two sets of equations. One is the variational free energy equation. One is the expected free energy equation. And uh, if you can work from that, just for someone who's getting interested in the ideas, I think you're going to go very far and it's going to, stuff is going to get a lot easier once you start to understand those equations. Whereas I think my experience has been starting from predictive processing sometimes gets you a little bit confused because you really struggle with stuff like decision making, habits, um, even something like just having hierarchical parametrics, uh, parametric modeling. So it's, a, it's, it's an educational point, but I think it's one worth making. That's it, it's really great there because kind of just pointing at kind of what needs to be done, the challenges of like how do you think about different thi different things like action and perception. Well, well, I guess they're they're integrated, but they're, you know when you're actually modeling it, you know in some yeah. ways it's more effective to model one as like say discrete, discrete, discrete perhaps, and another as continuous. And uh, I, I kind of you know a question then is what do you plan and think sort of your future mm. in this field would be in the future of, of the field you know if like if the if I don't, know, I don't know but the mathematics and things are set and like what are we then doing with it and are we will we be applying it to different kinds of um modes of cognition psychopathologies you know what, what do you think it will evolve into it's a very good question um i don't know is my honest answer um I think you'll continue to see its expansion. Um, I think it depends on who you speak to. So there's the physics of active inference. And this is really physics. So this is people like what Maxwell Ramstead is doing and what Carl is interested in doing. And this is like what I was talking about, whether we're talking about state space active inference or the path integral version of active inference. And so you can start to get very physics heavy conversations mathematical questions about exactly what is the free energy principle staking um and sort of how far can it go before let's say it needs some kind of empirical evidence so that's one side is the kind of physical side which i'm not really too party to although i've tried to kind of learn some of the maths then you have the complete other end which is the philosophy side which is what i am working in i would say uh the philosophy cognitive science side so it's you do have the predictive processing lot. So um, Mark, and again, this is no, you can do predict, like predictive processing is perfectly fine. It's just not the whole story. Um, but, you know, people like Mark and Julian Kiberstein and stuff, again, this is no disrespect, but they will use the predictive processing thing for like psychopathologies and well-being. And you really can do that. And it's a great framework. And then within that philosophy subset, you have people who are interested in phenomenology. So phenomenology is the kind of systematic uh, study of lived experience, of consciousness, of conscious experience, not consciousness really as an ontological object. That's more analytic philosophy of mind. And this is people like Lars Sandved Smith, Juan Diego Bogotá, um, Antoine Lutz, Jacob Hovi, and hopefully myself. Um, so this is kind of what the PhDs I'm applying for are all in so-called computational phenomenology. So computational phenomenology or neurophenomenology is a phrase or phrases um, created by Francisco Varela in 1997, I believe. Um, and it's basically the idea that we have a, uh, well, you, you can have different levels of description, really, let's say. So you have conscious experience, lived experience, and our analysis of lived experience through the phenomenology. So people like Herschel, Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, Dreyfus, and so on. And some of the stuff earlier you were saying about sort of just habits in everyday life is very Dreyfus-y. And then you have uh, the neuro, the physiological mechanisms, right? And that's the purview of neuro, neurologists, neuroscientists, and you know people interested in anatomy and so on. And then you also have the functional or computational side, which is for computational modelers. 
And the point being is that can these free, what's, what Varela called the triple braid, can this triple braid, uh, can they mutually inform one another and constrain each other in interesting ways? So I would point people here in the direction certainly of Varela's paper, that 1997 one. There's an excellent paper by Ramstead and colleagues, massive author list, so excuse me for not mentioning you, but Ramstead, Maxwell Ramstead and colleagues, 2022, uh, which, is a, which basically said, calls this process of trying to like ground phenomenology in uh, neurocomputation uh, as a so-called generative passage. A preprint has just come out, I think, last month. Lars Sandberg Smith and colleagues um, talking a little bit more about how the sort of uh, multi-perspectives one can have on active inference. So whether you're taking the perspective of kind of the path of the internal states or the uh, path of the uh, uh, beliefs that the internal states have about the external states, um, how that maps onto the triple braid. Again, it's quite a new preprint, so excuse me, Lars. He'll probably message me. Um, so there's plenty of work going on in this computational neurophenomenology. You asked what I'm interested in doing. This is kind of what I'm applying to do my PhD on. So I'd like my PhD. The, the idea right now is that Active Inference does quite a good job. No one stole my ideas because you heard it here first, by the way. Um, Active Inference does an okay job, I think, maybe, of saying how something like the sense of self emerges. So we propose... I mean, I say we, I don't know because I'm not committed really um, to the idea that the self is a hypothesis. It's a best guess. You have all this incoming sense data and you need to derive the underlying latent causes of it. And the self is just one of those. So that's kind of the how. No one has really thought about the why. So why do we have a self? What's the benefit of a self? If there is no so-called ontological self, like a Cartesian little soul in, you know, a homunculus in the brain, like why do we have this appearance in consciousness in the first place? There's a little bit of it in the work of Thomas Metzinger, like a little bit, but no one's really done it from an active inference perspective. So I am proposing to do the function of self from a computational phenomenology approach. There you go. Yeah. You got that. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and, uh, you know, have you, have you watched John Vavakey's series, The Elusive Eye? Have I you... don't think I do know about his elusive eye. I'll, I'll send it to you. I mean, it won't be, it won't be, a, predictive, it won't be a predictive processing account. That's all right. Um, um, yeah. But it's 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 really great on uh, the the first they tackle of you know does the self exist or not that kind of mm. the question that you know you're putting aside the active inference can explain, and they go in a way yes but you know to a, the, the to the degree that it's a functional yeah thing kind of yeah. can you know the kind of in the Jungian sense of like there is a self that grounds the ego and other parts um, that kind of centers everything together um, and so there is a kind of a function. Um, and, uh, you know, if you watch it, you probably know more about it than me, as you say, you're, you know, you're thinking about these things, but it's uh, such a great series. Um, well, no, thank you for pointing me in that direction. I mean, uh, in truth, John's relevance realization has been a massive inspiration for this um, in sort of a subtle way where I sort of forgot about it or didn't think about it. And then I was thinking about, OK, what could the function of self be? And my idea right now is it's, it's what I'm calling a relevance filter. Um, so it allows the most relevant or salient um you know it, it, it's a kind of coarse graining filter that allows the kind of uh, body's representations of the most salient objects into phenomenal space to allow for like rapid action there's more to it um but i won't go into it because you know that's the point of this phd but yes it, it was funny because john's ideas are super consonant with that overarching idea which is that like we need to coarse grain our environment so as to hone in on relevant things that's more of something like a world, what we would call a world model. I have a model of my world and I can put that into sort of coarse grain space, which might be really what consciousness is doing, like forcing it into phenomenal space so that I can act on it in a fast way. The point being here is why would I also represent myself in that world model? I, like if we go all the way back to Metzinger and the work he did in the 90s and early 2000s, the idea is that a self model, like my conscious representation of myself is always embedded in the world model. So the world model makes sense because it's like we have a nice condensed coarse grained representation of the world that we can act on. My question is, why do we also represent something like ourselves within that? Is it, is, does that also allow for like more adaptive top down control? That's something that Thomas Metzinger would say it allows us to enslave our own body. Um, I guess we'll see. Yeah. I guess we'll see. One final thing is you, yeah. in thinking about these kinds of questions, do you yourself, think 
about the phenomenology of your own experience and cons- and just think because I mean so I do um like particularly a lot of experimental and behavioral economics mm. and I'm just constantly thinking about things like you know how do I observe things like probabilities or thinking about personality theory like what why am I doing that and then, and sometimes it can be really great I'm I'm spending loads of time thinking about how my mind works to try and think about how that applies to other people and the other times I feel like am I going insane like just right analyzing myself and my experience to such a, a great degree um and so yeah how how's that well, been for you no, good question i mean <laughs> we all have to contend with our own experience uh there is no view from nowhere to, to use thomas nagel's terms um and i think i think it's it's um well maybe jung would call it inauthentic it'd be something like that to shy away from that and not see that as like the fundamental lens of analysis is your own phenomenal experience do i in some obsessive psychopathological way (laughs) potentially reflect on myself maybe in moments um i think what prevents some of that and this is a slightly technical point but i think it's interesting is that a lot of what we're interested in is what we call so-called pre-reflective awareness and what that is is awareness which you kind of live through this is the kind of phrase that people use so there's a difference between reflective self-awareness and non-reflective self-awareness. And it, it's, it's, I think it's somewhat easy to have an intuition on what that means. Uh, when you are walking around, there are different levels of self-representation that are going on. You can be thinking about yourself, which is very much uh, what I would call a self-conceptualization. It's very metacognitive. It's very narrative, right? Who am I? What am I doing? And so on. Then you can be planning where you are representing yourself in an imaginary space and time but you might not actually be reflecting directly on yourself as a concept so it's kind of a lower level and then you have this thing of feeling like your body is your own uh feeling present things belonging to you so mindless perspectiveness having a first person perspective on the world now you don't have to reflect on any of that not like none of that needs reflection to be lived to be experienced it's lived through and People like Merleau-Ponty and Sartre and Dorothy Legrand have said that this is fundamentally a bodily phenomenon. And I think that's right, although there is some interesting work about outer body experiences and stuff like that. And, you know, this is a, for a different day. But the idea would be that the body is really the anchor of the self. It's really where the, what we call the minimal phenomenal self is grounded. And you can see that in the phenomenology. So it's something that we live through. There's this word ipseity. It's kind of I-ness in and of itself without having to become the object of consciousness. Why is that relevant to your question about me analyzing myself? Well, I can only analyze myself in a conscious, self-reflective manner. And I think what happens when you do that is that a lot of those features of ipseity self-awareness get lost. It's the same point as to why, for example, people say, um, you know, they talk about the Liebet experiment uh, where the, you know, the experience of volition of pressing a button, let's say, comes 600 milliseconds after the actual neuronal spike. But recall that, that uh, that's a self-reflective awareness, right? Become aware of when you want to click the button. But that's a, already a very high level metacognitive act. The point being, there are lived experiences which are happening dynamically that you might not even be aware of, but they bring with them this sense of I-ness, minus, and so on, which I personally think in some ways are beyond um, true analysis at any point of self-conceptualization or reflection, because once you do that, you've already entered into the kind of narrative self. They're, they're yeah. beyond language in many ways, and um, and for that, we should be quite happy, I think, because not everything should be reduced to the propositional. As I'm sure yeah. you, as I'm sure you think as well. Yeah, so John Vavaki addict. Um, I can I totally agree. Um, well, kind of really know where people can find your work. Active uh, inference insights, but yeah, tell me yeah, that. Any, any last words? Yeah. Well, Jack. Firstly, thank you so much. Uh, this was my first time being on this side of. Well, we're, there is no sides, but you know this side <laughs> yeah. of the microphone, which has been really, really fun. Uh, thank you for thank you for asking me great questions and listening. You're doing a great job um, from one podcast to another. I wanted to ask before I go, how, how did you discover all this stuff? What, what, what's, the, what's the path been for you? Active inference and, and this kind of side of well, consciousness. Well, active inference and then just broader sort of, I know you're very interested in consciousness and metaphysics. Yeah, and we yeah. didn't even touch upon, well, we did slightly touch upon consciousness, <laughs> but I'm just curious about yeah. how you, you're doing economics. Yeah. What's the kind of point of convergence? Let's see. I mean, I, I, when I, we had COVID, um, I was a time I was like 
just about to start my economics degree. So I picked that for various reasons. I, I love economics and I mm-hmm. loved economics. Um, but I was just listening to, I had way too much time, you know, just playing guitar all day and listening to John Paveki and the, <laughs> the meaning crisis, um, uh, my a levels were canceled, uh, which is probably great because now I could, you know, study cognitive science and, uh, uh, yeah, you didn't, I, again, you can kind of, when you hear, especially for me, like philosophy and things, you can kind of switch your brain off. I don't know what these guys are talking about, but I just kept listening. And then eventually you kind of see what John Paveki is wanting you to see. And right. you're like, oh, there's a, then it gave me a reason to like, keep listening, keep under, trying to understand cognitive science, uh, philosophy and these kinds of things. And, uh, as a very, uh, like creative thinker myself, uh, I realized you, I, I wouldn't want to lock myself into just thinking as an economist. Uh, so I would just be constantly listening to loads of podcasts. Uh, and then basically like when I finished my degree, I'd be, there were just some, there were just particularly some people that just, I wanted to interview. So it wasn't mm. like I wanted to make a podcast. There were just some people like Brett Anderson yep. and Greg Enriquez. And I was like, I just need to ask these people some <laughs> questions and you go, go to my first podcast. It's so awkward and, and so bad. And, uh, but you know, <laughs> yeah. but again, I just, I was like, I need to, I need to ask him some things. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and so it's just a, just a great outlet and excuse for me to learn and like, you know, and um, one-to-one sort of seminars and, with people. So, so yeah. And what, um, and what, what does the future hold therefore? Yeah. Well, I'm kind of thinking of doing a PhD in something like economics or cognitive science. Well, economics doesn't seem inherently related to cognitive science, no, but I'm interested no, no. in the, yeah. the behavioral economics and the psychology side, because I do think that, uh, it kind of the economist experimental toolkit of actually bringing economics to a laboratory environment is a pretty awesome way to kind of try and bridge these bigger theories in, in economics of mm. um, like, like rationality. And they have like, again, you can kind of think it's quite rigid, but when you have, you know, people have preferences, people have this and that. Yeah. And uh, it kind of does give you a kind of a, a cool framework to kind of see, okay, but what are the psychological mechanisms behind these uh, kinds of things? Uh, and, uh, I mean, I was thinking about cognitive science too, but as you talk about active inference and all the maths behind it and stuff, it kind of makes me go, it might be more interesting for me to just do what, do more of what I'm already good at, uh, because at the end I would like to go more deep. Uh, and so for example, I think with a PhD, you can pick your poison though. Right. I mean, there's, yeah. you don't have to, I mean, I, I'm probably not going to end up doing all the maths. And the maths that I do know still is extremely yeah. superficial. Yeah. So, yeah, well, that, no, that, that's, that, it's really helpful. I guess I'm kind of also, I'm working on some, some projects in my masters and right now, like on the confirmation bias yeah. and on the way people with different personality, um, make decisions in risk, risky situations and also non risky and just trying to think actually there might be some underlying way in which people perceive, um, um, probabilities in the world um mm-hmm. related nice. to things like that, things like personality so we'll see how they go you know if that if that pulls me in the direction of okay this is really cool yeah because um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know it's like uh i love people on the cognitive science side but uh like where i where i am in nottingham in the uk um there's just a great uh like behavioral economics department mm-hmm. and you have like these like um great uh like german economists have just been in the field for like 20 30 40 years and and you kind of be enthralled by them and their thinking too. Oh. So it's there's kind of uh, too many paths that you know one might want to take. Um, yeah, just... you got well, you got to take a plunge at some time, you know, at some moment. And um, and 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 these ideas are always going to be here, right? I mean, um, they're not going anywhere. And I think the beauty of further academia, hopefully, if it's done well, is is the freedom to explore different ideas from different perspectives and enjoy an interdisciplinary, you, you know, enjoy interdisciplinary techniques. So I think whatever you do, you're going to find, you know, if you do do a PhD, you'll find, again, who am I to say? Because I'm not doing one. Yeah. Uh, but I sense that you'll find your thing, right? I mean, I, I have a hunch that many of these things are fundamentally personality traits and, you you know, you seem very curious and yeah. I think that's enough in many ways to get you in, you know, get you going. Yeah, it is very funny to think about, like, you know, you talked about the sort of phenomenology of the self. It is, it is funny for, for me to reflect on uh, the kinds of things which I'll just 
think about like are constantly are oh, that that well, I think there's an idea there uh, relating you know this personality to 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 this thing that people are doing and may, there must be you know some way to conceptualize why uh, personality is having this effect or and I'm like why am I all constantly thinking about this um you know um but you know for me personally the reason why I love things like personality theory and and even thinking about like schizotypal autism and the way just the way people differ is that I kind of I, I love seeing why people do things the way they do and how that relates to how other people do them. This right. kind of systematized way of doing things. And uh, so that's kind of one area that I would sort of like to explore. So Cool. Well, just yeah. I, I would just say keep at it. I mean, hopefully you found that, I don't know, my experience has been academics are incredibly generous and oddly, yeah, oddly willing to give you tips and, and tricks yeah. and help you on your career and, 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 you know, you're talking with me excluded, you're talking with amazing people, right? I mean, you, you spoke to Mr. Friston and, and, and Adam and Mark and Ben, you know, fantastic people. So just, I would just say, keep going. I think you're on the right path. Awesome. Well, Not that you are. Much. Well, well, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I just, just as an aside. Uh, oh yeah. So you asked where people can find my work. Um, so yeah, the, the, podcast is called active inference insights it's hosted by the active inference institute uh which i can also plug because they're a wonderful institute and really the best way i would say for people who are trying to get into active inference to start with their textbook groups um and, and other resources that they have i am also publishing papers um which i mentioned so uh I have a Google Scholar, I have a research gate, I have an orchid, you know, there are plenty of ways you can find me. Um, I have, yeah, so there, uh, my email will be somewhere. Um, it's Darius, well, you can, you can do the Royal Holloway yeah. one, Darius.parvizywayne at rhul.ac.uk. You see, Jack, I'm not used to plugging myself. I'm used to other people doing yeah. that. I have no <laughs> idea what I'm doing. I'm just fucking making it up on the fly. Yeah. No. Um, but I'm on Twitter and all those places. So if anyone has any questions or has any, yeah, has any comments, I, I'm always here for feedback yeah. and interesting conversations. I'm glad that you took the, the opportunity to take the sort of guest role and now you can have sympathy for, for your guests and <laughs> having to plug their work. That bit sucks. <laughs> I'm never going <laughs> to ask them to do that again. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Darius. All right. Thank you, Jack. Cheers.